We spent seven weeks in Colossians, which I know is a long time. We split it. There were four and then there were three. Just to remind you, Paul never went to Colossae. He loved the church there because he knows how well they're doing. One of the people who'd heard Paul preach, called Epaphras, had gone back home to Colossae. Almost certainly was the founder of the church there. If not, he certainly was um, prominent in the church. And Paul's under house arrest. He's in chains. He can't visit Colossae. But because he's heard so much about them, he wants to write to them to encourage them and also to warn them. He encourages them by saying yet again who the Lord Jesus Christ is. We all need to be reminded of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. So he teaches them a little bit more about him. And then he also warns against false teachers and tells them, be careful. They're infiltrators, they're sly, they're subtle. Watch out, stick to the basics and keep the main things, the main things. So after he's spoken about belief, he then talks about behavior, what not to do and what to do. Certain um, practices, certain forms of behavior are not on for the Christian. And he says things like, free yourself from sexual impurity. Don't lie, don't cheat. Be those who love each other, those who care for each other. And then he goes on to the positives of loving and forgiving and the way that they should live there in Colossae. Now we finished the letter last week and we're going to look today at this very short letter he wrote to Philemon. If you want to be finding it, it's just before Hebrews, it's right at the end of the New Testament and it's very much part of what Paul was saying, the subjects he was dealing with when he wrote to the Colossians. So I'm going to read this short letter, there are only 25 verses, put it in context, Go through it quickly, and then we can see the heart of Paul. Because this is a letter I could have put as a title for it, Redeeming the Time. Someone in chains like Paul was shows us what he did, when in that sense, not that he chose things to be this way, when in one sense he had time on his hands because he couldn't leave where he was chained. He had to be there. But he didn't waste his time, he didn't mope. He was actually very concerned still for all the Christian churches and still for the church in Colossae. So if we can have Philemon up please, and uh, I'll read it off the screen here. This is the NIV, I don't use the KV, the King James Version. I don't actually use the NIV, I believe you use it here, so that's why I, I do so. I remember once preaching in a church and uh, they had a thing, uh, a little piece of paper on the pulpit, and it said King James Version only, which is a bit restrictive. I didn't know till I got there. So I'd, I said to them, well, actually, um, I'm going to read to you from a version you might not be familiar with. It's called Good News for Medieval Man. I believe it's also known as the King James Version. So that's not to do next week's speaker down, but uh, my view on it anyway. Okay, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, so Timothy's with him, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. So he's writing to an individual, it's not the church. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an old man, now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, 
but now he's become useful both to you and to me. I'm sending him, who's my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favour you do will be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He's very dear, dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you, can, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he's done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one thing more, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. That is an amazing letter. It really is an amazing letter. This is the situation. Philemon almost certainly was a wealthy man. In his home, probably the church in Colossae met. Might have been other homes as well, but certainly the church in Colossae met in his house. The building doesn't matter at all. Home, church building as we call them, the church of the people who meet together, set apart and called out by the Lord Jesus Christ. But Philemon had been willing to open his home, offer hospitality and welcome the church into his own hope, home. He had a slave, we'll come back to that in a moment, he had a slave called Onesimus, and Onesimus had done something wrong, almost certainly had stolen from Philemon. And in his misdemeanor, in the theft or whatever exactly he'd done, Onesimus then did a runner. Now think about this. The church in the home is in Colossae. Onesimus, when he, whatever crime he'd committed, when he ran off, went all the way to Rome. 900 to a thousand miles, depending on which way you go. Boy, that is some run. How did he get there? How did he afford it? Was it because he'd stolen money and paid his passage to somehow get to Rome? But it's very interesting that in the providence of God, whatever the mechanics of actually getting from Colossae to Rome, he got there. Did he know Paul was there? Did he go to Rome specifically because Paul was there or just went as far as he possibly could and then discovered that Paul was there? We don't know. But whatever happened, he found or came across or visited or was invited by Paul wherever he was being imprisoned, met Paul, and became a Christian. It's an amazing story of the providence of God. Philemon the wealthy man. His wife, by the way, almost certainly is this lady mentioned here, Aphia. And his son could well be Archippus, the one who's also addressed in the letter. This family have lost this slave because he's run away. And by the way, the wife, Aphia, almost certainly was the one who organized what the slaves did and looked after them. So she too would have been very much affected and offended by what Onesimus has done. He writes to this family with a plea. I know what you think of him. I know you think he was an absolute letdown. 
useless. But he's become a Christian and I'm going to vouch for him. I want you to forgive him. Now, when we did Colossians, which you can find just a few pages back, I don't know if you remember this verse. It's in chapter 3, and Paul writes this to the whole church in Colossae, and this is the title for today. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. One of the instructions he gave to the church in Colossae is, know how to forgive. Don't bear grudges. Don't let things fester, even if you've been offended, even if you've really been hurt, forgive as he forgave you. So important that we know how to forgive and don't bear grudges and don't let things like a root of bitterness or whatever, hostility, enmity, grow. Forgive. As the Lord forgave you was the instruction to Colossae. Paul has written the letter. Philemon may well have already read those verses and maybe he's taken them to heart and Paul pleads with him, please forgive him. So here we go. Verse 1, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, he could have said he's an apostle. He's going to certainly hint at that later on. Because as an apostle, he could have actually been far more overbearing with Philemon and almost, in inverted commas, ordered him to accept Onesimus back and ordered him to forgive him. But to order somebody to forgive might have not been the best thing quite at the beginning of the letter. And by the way, this is a letter that shows us how to be tactful how to be careful, how to be courteous, but also to speak our mind. I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, is with me. To Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. So there's love, there's affection between Paul and Philemon and he recognizes him as a fellow worker in the church in Colossae. To Afia, our sister, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church that meets in your home. The son is working in the church, a fellow soldier, because of course we all know as Christians we're in a battle. So the whole of Philemon's household is engaged in the battle. Grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said that. So often, grace, God's mercies come to us, I wish it upon you still, and peace that only he can give from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always, verse 4, thank my God as I remember you in my prayers. Redeeming the time. Paul, could he get out? Could he go for a walk around wherever he was imprisoned? Was he always stuck, chained to a soldier? Did the soldier stay? Did the soldier take the chain off, the handcuff as it were, chain him to some railings and buzz off? Who knows? But he was stuck under house arrest and redeemed the time. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers. I don't know about you, but I'm very poor at remembering people in prayer. And there's nothing worse than almost wanting to say, I've been praying for you, and you know you haven't. Too easy to say, isn't it? I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. He's some guy, Philemon. The faith he has, the love he has. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Remember when we did Philippians? Had people been converted even when Paul was there under house arrest? Yes, they had. Amongst the guards, amongst Caesar's household, redeeming the time, praying for people and witnessing to people. He had, and he hears that Philemon has, and urges him to carry on. Have you ever shared your testimony 
the gospel with anyone else ever. I'm not sure some Christians have. Are we bothered? Do you want to take somebody to heaven with you? Paul would meet those guards when he got to heaven. He'd meet Philemon when he got to heaven and Colossian Christians who he'd never met on the earth when he got to heaven because he prayed, because he witnessed, because he shared. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. That's some ministry, isn't it? Refreshing the hearts of the saints. Maybe, maybe Paul had a little bit of a thought of the hospitality Philemon had been showing in his house. He'd opened it up and was hospitable, but he meant far more than that. You have refreshed the hearts, not the stomachs, the hearts of the saints. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold, this is verse 8, in other words, I could actually say something now, I am an apostle and could almost be pointing the finger a little bit, not cracking the whip, but I could be a bit stronger in my approach, although I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. What's the verse from Colossians? Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Why have any of us been forgiven? Yes, we've confessed our sins. Yes, we've repented. But we've confessed and repented and been forgiven because God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life because he loved us. God sent his son because he loved a lost world. The son came because he loved a lost world. I could be bold, but I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then as Paul, an old man, and I don't know the full chronology of things of all these letters, try to work it out. People a lot cleverer than me, I think probably know better. Paul was definitely not 70, he was in his 60s and he's an old man. So if you're over 60, he's an old man. And a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. Not literally in the flesh a son, not family, but a son because we're all one in Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus who became my son while I was in chains. I'd love to know what happened. Make a great film this. Paul's there. Onesimus is there. The traveling is massive. The cost would be massive. The danger's massive. What was Onesimus thinking? Where was he ultimately headed? In the province of God, he met Paul and became a Christian. Formerly, he was useless to you. I don't think that means he was a useless slave, but because of what he did, he was no longer going to be any use to you at all. But now he's become useful both to you and to me. Paul's very clever, very tactful this. He's useful to me because he's encouraging me. He's at my side. He's supporting me. And you know what? I think you're going to welcome him back and he's going to be useful to you. He's become useful both to you and to me. I'm sending him who is my very heart back to you. Boy, some relationship must have developed between Paul and Onesimus. But I tell you this, I guarantee because of what Paul says, Onesimus came clean. I've blown it. I hold my hands up. I've blown it big style. I need forgiven, to be forgiven. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. That's an amazing statement. He's been so useful to me, such an encouragement, so helpful. Did he go on errands? Did he bring stuff in for Paul? Don't forget the situation Paul was in. If other Christians didn't help, if other Christians didn't contribute, Paul would have had none of the comforts of this life. Change of clothes, change of bedding, change of diet, nothing. 
He's been so useful helping me while I'm in chains, but 14, I did not want to do anything without your consent because he belongs to you. He is your slave. So that any favor you will do will be spontaneous and not forced. That is brilliant if you think it through. Some psychology there. There really is, but brilliant. Now then, just come, if you would, to 1 Timothy, chapter 1. If I get this right, I made an ugly one. Right, verse 8. Slavery. There's nothing here to do with whether slavery is right or wrong. And it's wrong. There's nothing to do with that. It was part of the culture of the day. Paul recognized that Philemon was a slave owner, a slave master, but he didn't remotely ever suggest that abuse, mistreatment or anything was acceptable. He didn't say, I'm going to send him back to you and you can beat the living daylights out of him if you want. That's not what Paul's about. Now listen to this from 1 Timothy chapter 8, verse 9. We know the law is not made for the righteous, but for lawmakers and rebels, which is what actually has found Onesimus out. The ungodly and the sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers and mothers, or for murderers, so that's what the law's for. Listen to this. For adulterers and perverts, for slave traders and liars and perjurers. Slavery was part of the culture. But anything by way of abuse, anything by way of mistreatment, anything by way of breaking the law, and there were laws, Paul says, those people should be condemned. So despite the fact we might not like slavery, a slave trade wherever, of whatever sort, Paul is saying, I recognize who you are. I recognize who he is. I don't believe for one minute you abused him. He abused you by his behavior. He's come clean, he's repented, he's been forgiven. Please take him back. And don't, when you take him back, take it out on him. Accept him as a brother. I accept him as a brother, and in fact, he's so close to my heart, I accept him as a son. 15. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good. You can read into that what you want. That's actually brilliant if you think it through. Perhaps he was away from you to let you really think all about forgiveness, as we all should, based on this letter. The depth of forgiveness, the sincerity of forgiveness, the genuineness of forgiveness. But I want you to have him back for good, 16, no longer as a slave, better than a slave, as a, ver as a dear brother. He's very dear to me but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. There's no barriers, no Super League. There's no, I'm Premier League and he's absolutely useless back in amateur status or whatever. There's nothing like that. He's a man and a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, as I want you to consider him a partner, Welcome him as you would welcome me. Philemon's not going to say no to that, is he? He'd welcome Paul back any day. They'd love to have him. Never had him. Specifically in the church in Colossae, they know all about him. How had Philemon become a Christian? Had he met him at all ever when Paul was in Ephesus, the nearest he got to Colossae? Who knows? Lots of unanswerables. But if you consider me a partner, Welcome him as you would welcome me, and if he's done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I have a feeling Paul knew maybe he didn't. But if there was any redress needed, if there was any recompense needed, if there was any way of setting things straight, and it would cost, Paul says, I'll take the cost. 
to myself, I will assume the debt to you. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I'll pay it back whatever he owes you, not to mention that you owe me your very self. It's brilliant, this, it really is. I'm not a psychologist, like most psychologists. Potter, it's brilliant, it doesn't matter. But anyway, Paul says some brilliant things here to really focus on the need to forgive Onesimus. You owe me your very self, 20. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. The best thing you could do, Philemon, for me in chains, is to receive this guy who blew it, who messed up, Give him not simply a second chance unwillingly in one way, just hesitantly. Receive him as a brother. Receive him as someone, as a partner in Christ. And I write to you, confident of your obedience, 21, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Go overboard in welcoming him back. And one thing more. Prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Don't know if he ever was, but he wants to come and visit Philemon. And I have a funny feeling when Philemon read, what's that verse, 22, it will be, well, if Paul comes, maybe really, really, I should have received and accepted an Onesimus back. Now, here's a question. Did Onesimus ever go back to Colossae? <clears throat> Don't know. Did Philemon ever forgive him? We don't know. But I bet you Onesimus did, and I bet you Philemon did, on the basis of this wonderful letter. And how does it finish? Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. The letter, the whole of the letter has been on Philemon and Onesimus, but hey, Epaphras is a prisoner in Rome with Paul, and it hardly matters as part of the letter. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner, sends you greetings. So do Mark, John Mark, who blew it with Barnabas in the book of Acts, do you remember? He's back now, just as Paul wants Onesimus to be back. Mark's come back, Aristarchus, all this lot are mentioned in Colossians. Demas at the time was with Paul, but if you read 2 Timothy chapter 4, Demas is going to walk out on the gospel. So here's one that's in reverse that unfortunately ran well but then runs out. And Luke, my fellow workers, we're all here, we send you our love, and I reckon when. Philemon sees that list of men, he can't do anything else but have Onesimus back and forgive him. And how does he finish? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Because ultimately, forgiveness, acceptance, love are all spiritual. They're not physical, they're not psychological, they're spiritual qualities we're in a spiritual battle but we also have a lord who forgave us so please philemon forgive him as the lord forgave you this is a great letter hope it wasn't too fast if you think it was go home and read it read a good commentary do far better than i can do on this but i don't know about you i really really was encouraged just reading this letter and we're going to meet around the Lord's table now. And what's the whole emphasis of this table? Forgiveness, love, grace, and peace. It's all in context. Thanks for watching all. I hope you enjoyed the video. If so, consider subscribing so that you'll be notified when we add new videos. Thank you. God bless. Take care. Bye.